I'm exploited as a worker, but I'm a citizen of the richest country in the world. Or, you know, I'm disadvantaged as a woman, but I'm white. And that gives me access to some opportunities that other people don't have. So what that means is that when people are thinking about different political strategies, it's a very complicated picture, you know, like, oh, maybe I have something to gain from uh, more reproductive rights, but oh, maybe I have something to lose from the destabilization of the status quo. My name is Nancy Fulbury, and I am a professor emerita of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a director of the program on gender and care work at the Political Economy Research Institute. I think the meaning of class is kind of changing in some ways. It's, it's evolving. I think originally it was defined as a relationship to the means of production, like owners versus workers. But there's kind of an analogy between that definition of class and some definitions of other socially assigned groups that have uh, experienced pretty hierarchical inequalities. You know, like you could think of women and men as groups defined by a different relationship to the means of reproduction. Or you could think of uh, racial ethnic differences as a relationship to a means of kind of cultural uh, identity and uh, distribution of, of, of resources outside the market and inside the market. So uh, what I try to do in my work is think about both the parallels between different forms of uh, group inequality and the, the, also the overlaps and the intersections. And the end result is a picture of inequality that's more complex and I think more, more resilient, but perhaps in some ways also a little bit more vulnerable uh, to, uh, to critique. You're asking me how economic oppression differs from social and other, uh, well, sometimes people put it this way, you know, there's a difference between economic exploitation and social or political oppression. And uh, I think that is a kind of a false binary and that the relationship between these different forms of inequality is, is somewhat different. That almost all forms of inequality have an element of exploitation and almost all forms of inequality have a form kind of, of oppression. And it's usually related to differences in bargaining power based on group membership. So if you're a worker versus being an employer, if you're a woman versus being a man, if you're a um, white versus a person of color, if you're a citizen of the most affluent country in the world or you're a citizen of a really poor country that's experiencing terrible drought and famine. So in, in every case, it's not a characteristic of you as an individual. It's something about your place and the structure of society and of the distribution of wealth and power. And it has ongoing consequences for your access to resources like education, income, social safety net, employment opportunities, so forth and so on. So how has feminist economics morphed into kind of a, a, a bigger picture of differences in political economy? I think it, it, it actually has, the story kind of has political origins, which is that uh, feminism went through a period um, of being very vulnerable to criticism for being very inattentive to racial ethnic differences. And uh, that forced kind of a rethinking of um, the way in which we've implicitly kind of ranked different forms of inequality. So the, the paradox, I think, for a lot of feminist theorists was for years we objected to being placed on sort of a lower level of importance than class inequality. And then suddenly we realized we were doing the same thing uh, to people who were concerned about uh, racial ethnic inequality. Like, oh yes, that's important, but you know, really we're, we're centering this. Anyway, I think that uh, sometimes a lot of changes in political theory are an outgrowth of kind of political practice and praxis. And that, I think, you know, that's an example. And really the word intersectionality and the kind of intersectional vision was really kind of the outgrowth of black feminism and feminism from the global south uh, kind of grappling with this, this contradiction. And I think it's proved to be a very fertile, uh, very generative uh, kind of evolution of thinking. Classical political economy, it's, it's so fascinating whether you're looking at Marx or antecedents like Ricardo, uh, you know, they just take labor as a, for granted. Uh, labor, labor exists, labor is produced kind of by the natural world. And then labor is a key input into everything else. And so in the classical political economy world, everything is produced by labor, except labor. Uh, 
you know, the time, the effort, the money, uh, the uh, 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 emotional energy that goes into uh, creating and developing and producing human capabilities is just like given like, like you know, it's a, like a natural asset or something. So uh, I think uh, economists are just beginning to come to grips with what is clearly uh, not a very um, holistic analysis. I try to frame my ideas without a whole lot of regard for their possible strategic viability. Because if I start thinking too hard about costs and benefits, I feel like I get kind of derailed. Uh, I do think that there is a momentum to ideas. And I do believe in the momentum behind this idea of social reproduction. And this idea that we need to, to think more about how labor is produced and, and also about how society and our potential to cooperate with other members of society is produced. And the reason I think that is because I think we're facing uh, several related crises uh, that are kind of result from our failure to think about that bigger picture. And one of those is global climate change. And I think many people are now very aware of the fact that our economic system literally created incentives uh, to overexploit natural resources and to over um, pollute uh, the natural environment in ways that actually uh, may well be leading to long-term economic crisis. And I, you can think about social inequality, I think, in very similar terms. That is, th there are a lot of things about the social environment that seem very toxic. You know, we have very high levels of crime, we have very high levels of inequality, of poverty, of deaths of despair, things that are very costly. We don't really keep account of them. We don't subtract them from our gross domestic product. But I think people are generally aware of, of the costs uh, that they impose and are concerned about what, you know, wh what it takes to have, to maintain, to reproduce a society in a sustainable way. Um, for very good reasons, because I think we feel we feel the threat. You know, the single-minded pursuit of self-interest is pretty much a recipe for extinction. I like describing it as a recipe for obvious reasons, uh, and I think it's because um, self-interest really works well in, or, or can work pretty good in in some forms of exchange between equals, uh, where each has something to gain, and they're each just kind of in a position to ensure that uh, they can demand something resembling a fair price for what they're buying or selling. But exchange doesn't really work for things that are not easily exchanged on a per unit basis, uh, like uh, public goods of the environment. You know, There's no price put on wild fish. There's no price put on trees in the Amazon. There's no price put on clean air. There's no price. You know, you're not paying on a, you know, a, a per unit basis. And uh, likewise, if you think about intergenerational relations, you know, we don't we don't exchange with future generations because they're, they're not born yet. I mean, exchange is just not a feasible model for thinking about our relationship to, to future generations. So these are examples of what economists and social scientists in general call coordination problems. And coordination problems require cooperation. If you don't cooperate, basically, you everybody ends up being worse off. And don't get me wrong, it's always been true. There's always been coordination problems. This isn't like a new uh, phenomenon, but it's become a much more serious problem because we've been, you know, a lot of our success, measurable success in the market economy has come at the expense of unpriced natural assets and unpriced natural processes and social processes. And so we, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a paradox that our abundance uh, has been purchased at, at, at a pretty high price. And now, uh, in order to uh, kind of uh, pay that price and move on, uh, uh, we need to get together and agree on what to do about it on a global level. Uh, I think that's, you know, that comes through very, very clearly in discussions of climate change. But it's also very, very, very true about the social climate as well. If the 1%, um, were all we needed to worry about. If that was the source of all inequality in the world, it would be really easy to organize against them and to establish a more egalitarian uh, and more cooperative system. But that's not the world we live in. We live in this world of very complicated overlapping hierarchies in which almost everybody 
is in a somewhat contradictory position. You know, like, oh, I'm exploited as a worker, but I'm a citizen of the richest country in the world. Or, you know, I'm disadvantaged as a woman, but I'm white. And that gives me access to some opportunities that other people don't have. So what that means is that kind of when people are thinking about different political strategies, it's a very complicated picture, you know, like, oh, maybe I have something to gain from uh, more reproductive rights, but oh, maybe I have something to lose from the destabilization of the status quo because it might um, diminish other privileges that, that, that I enjoy. And so um, I think it has an immobilizing, I mean, you could argue that it has a stabilizing effect. And I, I do think it I do think it helps explain why hierarchies tend to persist, is that everybody is kind of, not everybody, but a lot of people are locked into a system where they're really afraid of losing something as the price of gaining something. And you know, one of the really important points of economic psychology is that we all are very loss averse. It's, it's more painful to us to have something taken away from us than not to get something that we don't yet have. And so, I think intersectionality helps explain a lot of status quo, uh, a lot of status quo inertia, and a lot of status quo complacency. Because you think, well, you know, the world is a little unfair, but in some ways, I, I, I would benefit if it were not so unfair. But in some ways, I might actually be kind of hurt. So, oh, what do I do? And so, what I think that means is that um, to to build a coalition for political change, you need to bring people together around a vision of changes that would make them very significantly better off along a very significant dimension of their identity. And that may differ according to circumstances. So sometimes in the past, class identity, workers versus employers, sometimes that has been sufficiently um, uh, powerful and momentous to overcome other divisions. Sometimes it hasn't. And likewise, gender, you could think, you know, sometimes, you know, women are very different. Women pool income with men. Women live in different communities that, you know, it's gender is not the only defining characteristic of, of women's relative uh, position, right? But around some issues, they have a lot in common. Reproductive rights is a really good example. That's a cross-class, cross-race thing. Not completely, because obviously you have better access to reproductive rights if you're in a privileged economic position, but you're still very much affected by restrictive rules and legislation, you know, both on a practical level and on a kind of cultural level. Or, or I don't know, look at Iran, you know, for years uh, there was just no movement in what seemed like a kind of impenetrable patriarchal society. And then suddenly that society took things too far in terms of violence and repression, and you see, Gender becomes this very significant mobilizing force with a lot of men in the streets, young men and young women in the streets together, really challenging uh, these really repressive patriarchal rule, rules. So, so that's you know I feel like our job as social scientists is to try to better understand why uh, coalitions coalesce in certain ways and how and think how we can use that strategically. Uh, to move towards a more a, a better set of rules for the global economy as a whole that's a lot bigger than say just end capitalism or end class conflict it's it's got to be something like we want fair play we want sustainable uh, relationships we want an ability to solve uh, uh, collective coordination problems we 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 want a larger set of ideals about how we manage our relationship with the natural world. And I think that's what's evolving. I think that's what activists, a lot of activists want and a lot, what a lot of activist slogans represent. And, but I think political economy needs to catch up. Theory needs to catch up to that kind of more decentered uh, vision of a, of, a, of, a, of a good society. And I think, I think that's what intersectionality helps us do.